Hello everyone and welcome to this Surface Ventures workshop. Please say hi in the chat and tell, you, tell us where you're joining from today. I've seen a couple of people already say hello. Uh, great that you're there and it seems like you hopefully you can uh, you can hear me. My name is Dr. Sam McMaster. I am the event manager here at Surface Ventures. We are a not-for-profit organization and our mission is to provide world-class material science education for academia and industry. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ben Beek of Micromaterials, who we are speaker today. After postdoctoral study at Hull, Nottingham, and UMIST, Ben joined Micromaterials, where he's been Director of Materials since 2006. He's a fellow of the IOM3, a past chairman of the IOP Tribology Group, and is currently a visiting professor at Manchester Metropolitan University and the universities of Leeds and Huddersfield. He's very active in collaboration with research with other nanotest users. All right, fantastic. Some great places that people are joining from. Frankfurt, hi Ben, of course, from Wrexham and Quebec, Canada. Fantastic. Uh, so many thanks to today's partner, Micromaterials. We will be releasing poll questions and handouts from them throughout the event, beginning with poll questions. And as we go along, please do type your questions into the chat. They will be marked for the Q&A session, which we will begin after Ben's presentation. We're planning to go for around 60 minutes in total today, and we will be sharing a link for your attendance certificates later in the event. So without, later, without any... Um, Further delay, let's invite Ben on stage and begin the talk. Okay, Ben? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Okay, fantastic. Let me get your slides up. Brilliant. There you go. Take it away. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks for the intro, Sam. So welcome and good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to be talking today about what we've called here a brand new test for assessing erosive wear resistance. So we developed this new test method for small scale testing if, of erosion of surfaces in collaboration with um, Cranfield University and the National Physical Laboratory here in the UK. And if we think about erosion, then Solid particle erosion occurs by the stochastic or sets or semi-random impact of many particles, uh, discrete different events on a surface. And you can see uh, bottom left there, actually, there's a, an impact surface after a sand erosion of a DLC. And that's actually from uh, Sam's PhD project. And in the middle is a um, surface of a thermal barrier coating after a um, a high speed erosion test. And on the right is the sort of thing that we're interested in is trying to mitigate erosive damage uh, for materials and demanding applications, particularly um, gas turbine uh, blades in engines that can be subject to um, particular erosion in different scenarios that can be, in worst case scenarios, can be life limiting. So if we continue to focus on that application, then the challenge for productivity and sort of towards net zero in gas turbine jet engines is to run them hotter. As these are Carnot systems, so if you, you get more efficient um, use of fuel, you reduce CO2 emissions um, just by running hotter. But the challenge is that this is a very demanding uh, application and you can 
develop coating systems to provide um, improved thermal barrier con properties, so um, better uh, lower th thermal conductivity, allowing you to drop a bigger uh, temperature gradient across the um, TBC. And these are particularly effective. They allow the superalloy substrates um, to operate even though the, um, the gas is actually above the temperature of the melting temperature of the alloy. Um, but, that, but these TBC systems are susceptible to erosive damage. So this, this is the challenge is how can we de develop efficiently a TBC system that has combined improvement to uh, improved um, thermal um, conductivity and resistance to CMAS attack while maintaining or even ideally improving its impact resistance. So this was the sort of background of the project. So we therefore said, well, what we need, these, these are the expensive coatings to develop. We need small scale test methods that allow us to look at small volumes of material and really to understand the link between microstructure and performance in these advanced coating systems. So in this presentation, I'm going to start off by introducing uh, a technique that we've called nano impact testing. We've been doing this for more than 20 years. It's quite a successful test at um, predicting ero relative uh, erosive wear performance. And then the thing that's new is this new randomized or statistically distributed impact test. So I introduce that for the first time and show how we've got uh, tests on model materials on um, so-called anomalous and normal glasses, fused silica and BK7, and show how for materials that have relatively similar fracture toughnesses, actually the, the erosion performance of these things is not correlated at all with the fracture toughness for these systems. And then I'll move on to looking at the E-beam PVD thermal barrier coating systems on, on a superalloy substrate. And I'll start off looking a little bit at repetitive tests at the same location. Can we get the same damage from our tests that we see in real erosion tests. So we've used focused iron beam imaging to get a handle on that. Then I'll move on to talking about the random or statistically distributed impact tests. And there we wanted to understand how does the type of statistical distribution affect the damage mechanism? What's the effect of the uh, spacing between the impacts and things like that? And does the test qualitatively and quantitatively predict the real erosion rate differences? And then I'll finish off with something we've done more recently, which is to extend all of this to high temperatures, because you know, clearly for the jet engine application, it, it runs at very high temperatures. So it's very useful if we can do just the same sort of tests conveniently at very uh, high temperatures. So. In our test, so we have a, a nanomechanical test instrument called the, the Nanotest Vantage, and it's primarily a nano indenter, but it also has a, a it's multifunctional. It does a range of different nano and micro scale tribological tests as well, and it can do these in different environments. So, one of the things that we developed and patented a long time ago is this ability to do high strain rate indentation tests that we call uh, nano impact. And in these type of tests, we pull the test probe, typically a diamond indenter, off the surface, and we fire it in, and this creates a, a true impact of a high strain rate contact. And if you look on the left there, you can see uh, essentially it's something bouncing on the surface, and you get a, a residual um, deformation, a rest depth, as it's called there. And if you look on the right, there's some examples there with a cube corner indenter on uh, on a alumina technical ceramic. And here you can see that the strain rate does drop through the test because it's a true impact test. But nevertheless, you can see those strain rates are really exceedingly high through the majority of that test. So they're much, much higher than you would achieve in normal quasi-static indentation. So you have a real high strain rate test that you can do in this test technique. So we were interested historically primarily with this test as a fatigue uh, simulation tool, essentially. So repetitively cycling the load 
And just like you can see on the top right there, that little woodpecker tap, tap, tapping in the way. And after a certain number of impacts, then you get material removal. So this is, it turns out to be a very effective uh, test method to introduce this damage uh, to the surfaces. And also um, we did it at various different temperatures as well. So it's standard and it, and it correlates very nicely with erosion. So here's some work um, from a number of years ago now, and this is some work in collaboration with Rolls-Royce and Cranfield University. And what you can see here is a um, electron beam PVD deposited thermal barrier coating system of zirconia stabilizing yttria. And yttria stabilized zirconia, I always get that the wrong way around. Um, and what we can see here is the effect of thermal aging on the damage tolerance and the erosion, erosion susceptibility of this coating system. So when it, when it thermally ages, the damage tolerance that the columns give you is, is reduced and there's some inter on intra column um, sintering and that uh, leads to uh, in enhanced erosion rates. And if you look on the top right there, you can see the nano impact tests on the same uh, coating systems and you can see that you get quite a nice uh, qualitative correlation. It's particularly useful because in these in these type of tests, the small scale tests, the, the test probe is of a few microns or well, in fact there's um, maybe a micron or something end radius and this this exactly matches the scale of the columns. So there's these columns are a few microns uh, in diameter and this is what happens in, in this uh, erosion regime. So you've got a test method where you're matching accurately the contact footprint of the test, and this uh, adds to the usefulness for its correlating purposes. So this is um, some work actually from Sam's PhD quite a few years, uh, years ago now. And what we're looking at here is three different um, diamond-like co carbon coating systems, and they have been uh, different um, chemistries, essentially. One is a standard hydrogenated DLC, Another one has been silicon doped, another one has been tungsten doped. And this doping has changed the mechanical properties and it's changed its um, impact behavior. If you see on the left there, you can see that the, um, it says coating C there, the tungsten doped is a much, much more resistant uh, coating than the other two. And if you look on the right, you can see the results of individual um, sand erosion tests that Sam did. So these are very sort of time consuming tests. And it's, would be nice if you again if you can use the small scale test to get all that data and predict nicely just with a few simple impact tests. So this all works quite nicely, but it doesn't quite capture the true nation, nature of what happens in a real erosion situation. So in a real erosive uh, situation, there are discrete events happening at different locations on the surface. So the damage from one uh, impact is affecting uh, the damage uh, later on. So there's a damage accumulation in the, in, in the materials in the surface. So we can, we've generated uh, or modified in our tests so that we can essentially move the sample stage in between doing these repetitive tests. And that allows us to create these different types of arrays of damage and we can program different statistical um, numbers of impacts, different distributions, and different array sizes as well. And this turns out to be a very convenient test method. So this is on the right, shows the example with a spheroconical probe. And this is a thermal barrier coating system. And this is the sort of thing, and this would be moving around in between the tests. So that's exactly the sort of thing we've done. Okay, so thermal barrier coating systems are inherently extremely complicated and they're very rough. So they have a remarkably rough surface by um, nanomechanical um, test uh, standards essentially. So, um, and we didn't want to polish them before testing. So we look um, to look at the real surfaces. But before we went on to that, we looked at some, some bulk um, standard well-characterized glasses. So here is an example with few silica. So here we've got 50 impacts within um, yeah, a square millimetre essentially here uh, with, a, with a, um, a rectangular distribution used in this case. So an equal probability of any 
any impact happening in any position within that square millimeter. So there's 50 impacts, and you can see they're fairly spaced apart. There's maybe there's some situations where one or two have, to, have been affected by the others, but essentially they're discrete. If we run that test on and we do it for 150 impacts, we get something fairly similar. Maybe get a little bit more overlap. Run it on a bit more. Now we're starting to get a little bit more regions where suddenly there's some we transition to a more severe damage regime. And we run it on a bit more and we're seeing more of that progression of that damage. So that's that's what happens on fused silica. So fused silica is an aluminous glass. It has a, essentially a, 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 um, a Hertzian cone cracking type dominated uh, cracking pattern. If we contrast what happens now with um, the borosilicate BK7, so this has a different uh, set of mechanical properties, a different crack morphology. It's actually tougher than fused silica. But if we look to see what happens in, in um, our impact test, we can see we're getting this crack morphology joining up between the different impacts. And this is promoting a transition to more extreme damage earlier. If we run under exactly the same conditions, we can see by 250 impacts, we're getting large amounts of the surface are starting to be totally uh, destroyed. And if we run it on to 500, we can see there that the whole surface is totally destroyed. So very clear, correlates with what you, what you see in the literature for erosion. So we have a very nice test. But what we have with our instrument being a nano indenter is we have the ability to, to monitor the depth throughout um, the test and we have various different metrics that we can pull out, quantitative metrics that we can pull out through this test. And this allows us to track the individual um, damage. So this is just an example of one, one test. And here we're looking at the, the probe depth and the velocity and tracking those as a function of time for a single impact. So the gray region marks the whole of the high speed indentation process or the impact process. So you reach a maximum velocity of, of, uh, at the surface, then you're getting uh, and a maximum velocity the other way when it's coming out. And from that, you can track various metrics. You can pull out the um, coefficient of restitution, residual depth, the kinetic energy absorbed in the process. And these things are all very powerful metrics when it comes to understanding what how you can design uh, impact resistant surfaces. So if we look here to contrast BK7 and fused silica, if we look on the left, we're looking at the residual depth from the uh, impact process. So there's a little bit of cracking on the fused silica, there's a little bit of variability, depths around five microns. You can see on the BK7 that it starts off fairly similar, but it's there's an upward trend in that residual depth. And then after about sort of 260, impacts there's a there's a more a, a change to a more uh, severe damage regime where really we'd be going even up to sort of 50 microns of uh, depth per impact on the right you can see uh, quantitative kinetic energy absorbed per impact and you can see again the differences between those two materials and also it pulls out quite nicely differences in the kinetic energy before that transition So these again relate to the mechanical properties in, in, the, in the different glasses. Another nice one we can look at is the coefficient of restitution. So this one is related uh, this, to the dynamic uh, hardness to modulus ratio in, in the material. So there you can see that the um, few silica has this, this higher dynamic H of re ratio and therefore it produces these more elastic impacts where the coefficient of restitution is is closer to one and we can track how these things change as a function of um, conditions as well and if we run under smaller forces uh, smaller accelerating distances we can get uh, coefficients of restitution quite up near one and equally we can get uh, more severe and go further down so essentially these are very complicated tests so we can also design tests where we can simplify things. In this case, we can we design tests where we control the spacing between 
uh, adjacent impacts. So in this case, all of these impacts, uh, so there's about 100 there or something like that, are under exactly the same conditions. The only thing that's changed is the spacing. So in this case, this is for fused silica, and this is between, say, starting off 100 microns apart or something, and then moving down to being almost completely overlapping down the bottom. And the spacing between the rows is kept at 100. And what you can see there, if you zoom in on the right, as you can see, there's a, a quite a, a clear abrupt um, transition between when they're 70 microns apart, under these conditions, they don't interact or they don't appear to interact. And when you take it down to 60 microns, then you're starting to get these cracks joining up between the coating, sorry, between the, the, the adjacent impacts. So we want to understand a bit more about that. And the, uh, these are essentially, because they're glasses, they're transparent, that allows us to use, like, get more information out of laser, laser uh, scanning and focal microscopy. So here's some work we did, um, again, with, particularly with Hanno and Peter at MPL. And here you can see just examples of, on the left is fused silica, and you can see um, actually that this, you can see some subsurface information that you can obtain. And, and these, these images under green light also, they're quite, so actually these interaction of the, of the um, Hertzian cone cracks actually create something looking almost like this subsurface straight line. And if you look on the right, you get a very different crack pattern on the BK7. So you're getting this much more radial lateral system with this much uh, completely different subsurface crack pattern. And this is the this is the sort of thing that explains these differences in erosion. So these differences are related to the differences in the mechanical properties in the glass, as shown there. And you can see how the um, ratio of the elastic modulus to the hardness and the Poisson's ratio um, affect crack systems. So it, on the right, that's just an example for Vickers indenture and a quasi-static test. But it seems very much that in our high um, strain rate dynamic test with the spherical indenture, we're getting very, very similar differences. Okay, so if we move on now to the thermal barrier coating system. So the sort of standard um, E-beam PVD system is yttria stabilized zirconia is used for particularly the harshest environments. And you can see it has a columnar structure, um, these sort of pyramidal tops to the columns. And on the right is, 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 is um, one of these candidate zirconates that has lower thermal conductivity, but not necessarily as good erosion performance. And the, these are sort of sort of two baseline systems to have a look at. So in this case, the gadolinium zirconate or GZO on the right has these sub, it has a sub layer of um, yttria stabilized zirconia underneath as well. So you see these are much more complex systems than the glasses. Excuse me. So if you look at the top, you can see the columnar structure there. It's quite complex and yttria stabilized zirconia. On, and on the right, there's a fib cut image going through those columns and you can see the pyramidal tops, you can see the um, porosity between the columns and you can see that in this case, they're fairly sort of normally oriented. If we contrast this to GZO, you can see again, a quite a complex surface here, these um, canted, if you like, um, columns. So there's about a 15 degree cant angle. Maybe you can just make it out on the right. And it's a very complex structure. And if we start off by just doing repetitive impact tests at the same position. So under these conditions, uh, this is at the end of sort of um, 50 impacts, getting quite a large um, impact crater. It's going across several columns. And what you can see on the left there for the Yttria stabilized zirconia is it's a really sort of compaction dominated mechanism under these conditions. And on the right, you can see for the gadolinium zirconate, you can see something quite similar, but actually within the middle of that crater, you can see some debris has fallen into that Im impact crater. So that, that points to a sort of toughness difference potentially in those two materials. And you can track um, the depths throughout these tests. 
and on different loads as well. And from those depths, you can convert, and this is a new result again on the project, we can convert from the depth data directly to impact volume by um, taking account of the probe geometry, the elastic recovery in the test and the, the contribution of the instrument flame compliance. And we can subtract all of that out and convert to um, impact volume. So there's some, uh, some examples there for um, yttria stabilized zirconias. This is after a single impact and at the end of the test after the final. You can do this for every single impact you like within your test. And you can see those are very linear reg uh, regimes, correlation coefficients very near one. So that's quite a nice thing. So we can do all that without needing even to particularly look at the look at the uh, craters. But there's a lot more information you can get out of um, looking at the craters, and particularly um, with the help of Diane at uh, Cranfield and and Lewis and Christine. Then we were doing um, some using fib image imaging to do cross sections through those craters. So here's an example, again at 500 millinewtons on the yttria sta stabilized zirconia system. And what you see there is the compacted zone in the middle on the left, and it's um, near the surface region, then essentially you're getting about sort of 15 or 20 mic microns of com compacted material. And then under under that, you can see these cracks going across several columns. It's the blow up on the right, you can see it more clearly. And that's really, that's the dominant uh, removal mechanism for uh, in, in erosion of these things. So the cracks go across several columns and then it causes the uh, removal of a large amount of materials. So if we do that same sort of test, but uh, under much uh, more severe conditions, then we can see something quite interesting. We're getting transitioned to something looking much more like a, a fatigue type mechanism where we're now getting this very, very fine scale debris now, this sort of submicron debris, and this, this complete breaking up of the structure. So we're able to do two types of tests here. So the interesting thing, of course, is well, how does that correlate with the real erosion uh, results. So this is a schematic of the erosion rig at Cranfield that's been around a long time, it's been updated recently. And here, the, and this, this rig allows the ability to do these very uh, high speed, um, high velocity erosion tests. So in standard conditions when you have um, angular alumina particles, around a sort of 100 micron size. This, this translates into doing erosion tests at a, around 200 meters per second. So it's quite a complicated thing. So the two main mechanisms that you see are this cracking across the columns and you get in some locations as well, you get this transition to this, this more severe mechanism where the whole structure fails. So these are exactly the two mechanisms that we see in a small scale test. So that's quite that's that's for the first time we were able to see that. That's quite nice. So very good. But the next stage was to do the randomised uh, impact test. So as I mentioned, you can do different types of distribution. On the left, you could do a Gaussian distribution where you have a higher probability of all, of your impacts occurring near a central spot, or you could make them equally spaced on the right. So there's an example there just of. Um, 500 impacts there. So if we zoom in now, these, these um, repetitive impact tests and see at small scale then, under these conditions, you can see compacted regions of the surface. You can see how the damage between the different uh, impacts is starting to progress. But there's, there's um, untouched uh, material between those um, impacts. So these are these are relatively early stages of the impact process. So it's compaction and, and cracking at the peripheries that are the dominant deformation. So if we compare the two um, materials, we can see that if you, in a real erosion test, they start off looking quite similar then, but within um, the steady state erosion, then you get a, a bigger transition and a bigger difference between those two materials. So the yttria stabilized 
zirconia is is uh, significantly it's about five five times uh, more impact resistant than the gadolinium zirconate. So we wanted to understand a little bit why this gadolinium zirconate was not performing as well. So in this case, we're doing exactly the same test. There's 500 impacts, but we're just changing the size of the um, region that we're doing those 500 impacts over. So it's all done automatically in the instrument software. You go away and set all of this up, it'll come back and do all of it together. And what we can see here is as we move from left to right, then we're decreasing the test area size. And now what we're seeing is that we're getting this complete dis destruction of the surface. And we're getting this, this real fine scale debris that we saw earlier with the yttria stabilized zirconia in, in the cross section. We're seeing that, that very fine scale debris. And then you're seeing, so you just see the last few impacts. The rest of the surface is, is basically covered up by the remains of this, this small scale debris. So the thing we can do is we can quantify the damage. So these are laser scanning um, confocal images again. So what we have here is 150 impacts on the gadolinium zirconate. And the, on the left is a rectangular distribution and on the right is a Gaussian distribution. And we're having a bigger volume, looks like it's about double on the right for the Gaussian. So, and we can track that in the middle we're looking at, say, the um, the final depth as a function of um, number of impacts, and you can see there clearly there's a much, there's a clearer transition towards this bigger damage regime for the red for the Gaussian distribution one. You can see on the right that there's um, a region of that material where it's been completely um, destroyed, and it's much less on the left. Similarly, we can look as the effect of uh, load. So on the right, we have a, um, at 500 millinewtons, and on the left, we have at one newton. And again, at the higher force, we're having a much bigger uh, removal of the material. And we can see that quite nicely again in how the residual depth tracks as a function of impact. So at the higher force, you can see in the red there, you're getting that transition occurring more extreme and more rapidly than at the lower force. So we have a very nice sort of quantitative control on understanding what's going on. So the other thing we can do is we can obviously compare across the two different materials. So here, these are um, rectangular distributions essentially. So the seven uh, y, y z uh, at the top there is by far the more, most impact resistance as the lowest volume. But if we run it on and look under more comparative, more severe conditions, in this case, um, with the Gaussian distributions, then we're getting a sort of about a three to one difference between those two. And that, that is, is broadly in the range of what you see in erosion, uh, real erosion tests, where they're typically around sort of four to six uh, times difference, for typical uh, samples. So then, Next step, step that we thought we would do is to, to extend all of this to high temperature. So this on the right is just a zoom in of a little part of the instrument showing a hot stage there. And in this, in this case, we can use this hot stage to heat up the sample up to 850 degrees. And then we can do our repetitive um, randomized impact tests um, just in the same way as we do at room temperature. So here's some examples back to fused silica now. And as we go through that temperature range, we, we change the mechanical properties of the glass. So the um, hardness modulus ratio changes as well as it softens a little bit. And what this results in essentially is changes in um, brittleness of the glass and also changes in how those crack systems develop. So these are examples just at the same position. What we can see here is um, at 830 uh, degrees C, here on the right, we're getting, um, it's, it's more crack tolerant essentially, so that the, 
there are more impacts needed and when and the progression once there is a bit of cracking that progression is more gradual than it is uh, more sort of abrupt and sharp on the left so back to the tbc's so here's some examples so the tbc's are considerably less exciting so it's, it's a system as a function of temperature so you can see there so the green is at room temperature the, the the red is at 850. And in terms of the final depth, you can say, well, actually, it's going in more at um, more at, uh, at the higher temperature. But actually, if you if you focus on the amount of damage, then actually, after the first impact, it's not so different. So there's there's a softening and a difference due initially. But if you focus on the damage tolerance afterwards, that red curve essentially um, the change in slope after that is, is, is if anything, slightly um, less than it is at room temperature. And, it, and this sort of thing does correlate fairly well with, with what you see at room temperature for 7 YZ, sorry, for, for high, high temperature erosion tests, essentially. So there's, there's not much difference in room temperature between room temperature erosion and, and the high temperature tests. And that, the differences that are there are really often related to differences in the um, of velocity essentially in, in the erosion test because typically the high temperature erosion tests are a little bit faster and that, that that does increase the erosion rate so we can also do some uh, just as at room temperature we can do these randomized tests there's just some examples there with different uh, sized um, randomized tests in this case 100 uh, tests here my colleague just just did this work and here um Again, we can do things like track the residual depth as a function of impact, and we can understand transitions and things and how those are affected by temperature. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a powerful test because we can do exactly the same things as we can do at room temperature. Okay, so that's just to, um, that's really it from me, I just really to introduce this new test technique. So it's got a lot of potential, we hope, and we settled on calling it randomized impact because statistically distribution didn't sound quite as exciting, but uh, we're interested to hear if you think that's a, a misstep. And certainly from what we've seen so far, it, it's got very uh, strong potential because it shows very good correlation with real erosion tests. And it's so much simpler to do. All of these tests that we've shown are really very quick, the order of a few minutes. And we can do this, extend this test recently up to uh, 850 degrees, and I'm sure we can go much higher in the future if we just uh, set our minds to that. So that's all possible. Um, on the right, you can see there that all of these different types of tests, we can track all these different metrics such as depth and um, coefficient of restitution and energy loss. And that really allows us to build up real pictures of how different material surfaces either uh, become more tolerant, tolerant or not. And I'll just finish with this one as a challenge. Uh, Sam said it as a workshop, so, so you're not going to get away without any uh, workshop related activity. So if you can look and, and try and choose, two of those images are real impact tests, and two of those images are real uh, erosion tests done at Cranfield. And in this case, this was not on either of those two. So this was on, on an optical uh, coating system, which was, had a relatively poor adhesion due to a, a plasma tree clean issue, which they then fixed. Um, so if you want to, by all means, uh, have a guess on the right, and we will mark them later. Okay, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks, Ben. Always good to have uh, a little bit of interactivity in these. So yeah, please. Uh, you know, put your guesses in the in the chat, and uh, we can we can have a look through these uh, through the answers in a moment. Uh, but what I will do now is just before we begin with the Q and A, is release the link uh, for the attendance certificate, which you can download now. So please click on that uh, featured actions uh, link. So just to make it clear to everyone, this will only be available in this event. So if you want the link, please, or if you want the certificate, sorry, please do click on the link now. Um, the link will still be active for the next day. So, you know, click it, open the tab, but come back. We're not finishing just yet. We still have quite a few 
uh, questions to get through. Okay. So, ah, we have our, our first guest. So Suresh has, has said, uh, the right hand is erosion. And Suresh is right. So <laughs> There we go. Um, right, just to make it clear for anyone who's asking, that link right there that I've also put in the chat, but you can also uh, you can also click uh, just in the bottom left hand side of the screen. It might be displaying differently if some of you are joining on mobile devices, but should still be there. Okay, so with that, let's uh, let's begin to work through the questions. So we'll go with. I think it's not working now. Oh. Right. Uh, doo -doo -doo. It's not working now. Does it work later? It does work. I've just opened the link myself, and it is there. So when you click on it, um, it will ask you for first name, last name, and email address. Okay. And then what it will do is send you um, a PDF of the attendance certificate to email. Uh, so. Brittany, please, you know, do try the link again. Um, I will have your, you know, from the registration, I will have your email address so I can, uh, I can, okay. So if you can try again in a few minutes, um, if not, I can follow up after the event just to make sure you can get your link. So I'll just make a, I'll just make a note of that. So, okay. Let's begin with the first question. So we'll go with oldest question first. So from Maxim, who asks, how do you take into account the formation of the mechanically mixed layer, mixture of test material, eroded part particles, oxides, et cetera, that can lead to an increase in hardness or other properties? I think this is when you were first talking about the structure of um, <clears throat> the thermal barrier coatings, Ben. Well, I uh, yeah. That's an, interesting, that's an interesting point to some extent. I mean, mm. so, so certainly, uh, sorry, you lost me there, I think. No, there we go. You're, you're back now. I can hear you again. Yeah, apologies if something happens. Um, yeah, in, in erosion of... TBCs, then, I mean, alumina and things like that, you don't tend to have these sort of um, mechanically mixed layers. You may get that with sort of silica type mm. um, erodents. So, I mean, I think the uh, the answer is how would we do it is we'd, we'd essentially maybe have different different types of um, dentures and things like this. So in this case, we wanted to simplify the test and have um, to correlate with alumina. Um, so we had a, a hard and much harder indenter than the material, but it, it would be just as possible to have potentially sort of um, the indenters that might 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 be uh, deformable as well. So these things are all possible. Um, but equally, the thing about adding the increase in hardness, well, I mean, it's also something where we can use this type of test to look at maybe the effect of or simulating a shot peening process. It's not just related to um, erosion. There, there's a number of sort of other side applications, even people have suggested micro pitting, also um, inter in interrupted cutting type situations. It, 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 there's quite a lot of different applications, essentially. I don't know if that's quite answered it, but that's the, off the top of my head, that's, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, <clears throat> yeah, effectively, it's very system dependent, really. So it's, you know, the nice thing is with it, uh, you know, as you're testing on a multifunction instrument, really, you can then you can do the erosion test and then swap to another test technique, like you said, with, you know, do indentation post, post test and, and so on. Um, Okay, so let's move on to the next question um, from Udea. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So do you have any test that is abrasion and erosion combined? Well, um, yes. Well, all of the tests I showed here were they were normal impacts, so 90 degree impact. But we have um, adapted it to um, to do angled impact which i think does catch much more of this abrasion erosion combination so and that works very nicely as well so um 
um, yeah, that works fine as well. So so you can do off angle, and we've done even up to sort of yeah, fifty degrees or something like that, mm -hmm. or something like that. So the, these are all possible different mm -hmm. choices of different probe geometry. So mm -hmm. I suppose that's the other thing I didn't say is that that um, by simply changing the sample orientation, you can easily um, look at lots of different tests. And th these things are very quick tests, so you can get these big matrices of results much much more easily. Mm -hmm. And with, with hopefully more sensitivity to, um, you could look at thin coatings as well, all sorts of things. Okay, very good. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so next question from Robert, who asks, what is the impact frequency during the test? In this version, then we were doing this around one hertz or something like that. Mm -hmm. So half a hertz to one hertz, something like that that sort of frequency. So mm. we then have there is another way we can do we can do this um, with a sample um, piezo behind the sample and do it that way. That would be more complicated and that's something else we could do. That would allow us to ask, access uh, higher frequencies. But for, for this type of test just um, these frequencies are around around one hertz and mm -hmm. it, we cause an awful lot of damage very quickly. So yeah. That's where we are with it at the moment. Okay. Got it. Okay. Was, uh, I'm just thinking back to when I did some of this. So is the frequency, yeah, is the, the available frequencies increased then since? Uh, yeah, since we, uh, yes, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Um, um, well, one of Thomas's colleagues wanted us to, to go a bit faster or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was just the, uh, just mentioning my, you know, my, PhD work later, and then just sort of thinking back to kind of what I had set for my things. But yeah. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the next question from Sankara, who asks, um, impact is unidirectional. The erosion occurs multidirectionally. Uh, how would the correlation work? Uh, well, I think it does, but equally at any, at any um, there's a dominant even if there's there's multi-directional, there's a dominant gas stream, and there's a, there's a dominant particle stream. So there's a dominant angle of attack that you simulate with any one test. If it's a 90 degree impact, you simulate with a 90 a, sorry 90 degree erosion, you simulate with a 90 degree impact, and vice versa. Vice versa. Would say if it's a 30 degree uh, erosion test, you'd simulate with a um, 30 degree impact test. And, and there, there's presumably all sorts of clever things you could do by moving the sample staging between impacts, but I think that would just add add more and more complexity. That, that um, mm. all of these things are possible because essentially it's sitting, it's, the sample is sitting on a stage that you have independent control over. Mm. So there are there are sort of there is a certain amount of flexibility. Okay, so yeah, it's very again very much uh, how much the user would want to program into their into their experiments. I guess the, the software fully allows for um, this stage movement between any impacts anyways, because you can make that X, Y adjustment for, you know, doing the grids as you've shown. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, a question from Suresh who asks, uh, please can you elaborate on how the kinetic energy absorption is calculated? That's a good question. Can I even remember how it got? There's a there's a there's an MIT paper that follows uh, a uh, uh, an analysis by Andrews, and that's that's where it's taken from essentially. Um, mm. But it's we've used um, we calibrate the mass, the dynamic mass of the uh, the, the system. We have the velocity in and the velocity out coming direct from the uh, the curves. So with the mass, we've got we can determine the kinetic energy in and the kinetic energy out, and from that we can say the kinetic energy loss. And um, people have also done uh, potential energy and things like that. Which I didn't in this, but uh, certainly Jennings and co-workers at MPL have done it that way as well. So there are, there are quite a lot of different options. Um, but the kinetic energy absorption or kinetic energy loss works works quite nicely. But, but you do need to calibrate it for the mass. So that's mm. got it. I was trying to see if I could uh, find that 
paper quickly to share it, but I think that might take a little bit of time. So it's best we uh, best we proceed with <laughs> further questions. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so I think we've we've somewhat answered this before, but one from Michael here, who asks in sort of old-fashioned erosion thinking, we learned that angle of attack is important. Your tester is only loading perpendicularly. How do we, do we now forget about the direction of impacting? No, I, it's a good point, isn't it? As I, I think I sort of, I'd said a little bit through the questions of the go, that um, there's always a predominant version. And, and I think the easiest for us to do on a test thing is, is to change the angle and then do everything under that that dominant uh, mm. yeah so the mechanical how much is 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 cutting and how much is plasticity you know this is this is the, oh, seems to be the heart of what causes these differences in brittle ductile deformation but but we can do all of that and we can get the same level of sensitivity to brittle du ductile transitions with angle mm. as well and, and indeed we have actually done tests at different um impact angles and then correlated that to um, models that are Cranfield as well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. There you go. So yeah, it's all all possible. Just it is it's all possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, really just depends on it's just I think as as you said many times, Ben, it's just increasing the complexity of the test then. So but yeah, from, from an instrument development point of view, it's always a challenge that you have to work out how much to increase the complexity. Well, yeah. It's an advantage, advantage for somebody and it's a disadvantage for somebody else. So, yeah. so we just try and increase the flexibility. And then and then from that, it's up to people whether, which route they choose. Yeah. Um, got it. So I think we've got a question from Sankara here who asks, is this test methodology accepted by aerospace industries for evaluating the high temperature erosion resistance of thermal barrier coatings? Well, it's it's a new method, isn't it? So the aerospace industry is notoriously um, conservative because at the end of the day, we don't want our, our, our um, airplanes falling out of the sky. So um, <laughs> that's so, so aerospace is particularly um, conservative, but I would say that, that what we're trying to do here is provide a tool that allows us to develop coatings more rapidly. So that's that's to cut down, to, to streamline these coating, coating development processes. We have these very, very long and complex coating development cycles that are very expensive. Mm. So when we're talking often to Cranfield and Rolls Royce, they're very much saying, well, the um, we develop these great coatings, but it just takes a long time and it's difficult to know where, yeah. And and also they're dealing with rare, rare materials as well. So, so none of this is simple, but we simplify that whole thing, get a lot of metrics out quickly. And we have that understanding. And then for your safety critical applications, then you're doing, you're going to use the actual one. Um, Oh, sorry, the connection just dropped out for a second there, but yes, it's okay. Um, perhaps just, just expand. Is it back? Is it back, sir? Yes, yeah, I can hear you again. Yes, sorry, it just it just drops out for a second, so I think we dropped the, just the last word of that answer. All right, sorry, it's just a, a stream of question lost in my thing, yeah. Mm. Um, I think I kind of got to the end, which was just, um, just the... Oh, no. There we go. We're back. <laughs> we're using this. We're using this thing very much as as as, as a as a scoping and uh, type test rather than, than the end result. Sure. Um, just expanding off of that answer, and this may be a little bit outside of kind of the scope of the test equipment at the moment. Do you think there might be some some room for um, a standard utilizing this equipment and you know this methodology in the future? Well, you hope so, but usually when you when you have standards, you need quite a lot of different uh, manufacturers to, to group together and say it's a great idea. And when, when you have something that's unique, it's a little bit more difficult to get it standardized. So yep. there's always the competing pressures. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as a, a, we talked about erosion very much today, but as I say, we've sold this thing for um, to uh, for PVD coating development uh, primarily, yeah. 
for a range of different applications to um, various different companies. And unfortunately, we can't say anything about it because they'd rather, they have a commercial advantage by having this instrument and therefore they would rather just mm. keep it as quiet as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, <laughs> and that's where we are. So, um, <laughs> Got it. Thanks. Uh, okay. So I'll ask, unless anyone else is, is typing any questions at the moment, I've got two more remaining <clears throat> from uh, Khaled here who asks, <clears throat> excuse me, in the case of multi-layered specimens, uh, do you think the mechanical behavior, uh, ductility and rigidity of the supporting layer could affect the results of your test? Did you, sorry, Ben, did you, did you hear that okay? Well, um, I'd say in the sense of it's a multi-layer system. Mm. Yeah, I did think so. It, in, in, in a multi-layer system, then I think that the, the um, sensitive to the mechanical properties across the different layers in the system, just as you are in anything like a scratch test or an indentation test or, or anything like that, um, the system itself, the, the, the instrument is, is, is effectively perfectly rigid as far as it's, or at least sufficiently rigid as far as they're concerned. Um, but if you put the same very hard coating and you put it on a, um, had a compliant sublayer or a non-compliant sublayer, then then you would be very sensitive to those different mechanical properties and you can model that out quite clearly. Mm -hmm. because that's what you would see in the real erosion test as well. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same thing. Okay, very interesting, thanks. Okay, um, question from Jan here. Uh, he says, nice talk. Uh, uh, how much can the initial impacting strain rate reach? What is the range of impact energy? The energies are small because they are, because they're over, um, you're ex using small forces and experiment to really small distances, but you're dumping that into a very, very small area. So, so the strain rate density or the energy densities are very high. Um, in terms of actual strain rates, um, it's something like uh, approaches 10 to the 5 on contact per second, I think is, I think that it was, it was, um, I don't know. It's about it's about slide five or something. I don't know if it's easy to go back or not go back. But... You can uh, scroll back quickly. Yeah, you take a look at that. Yeah. I'll tell you if it's five or not five. Yeah. That one. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry. One four. That should be. That should be a bit. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think we're just. Just having some connection issues again, everyone. Apologies for that. Are you uh, are you back, Ben? Can you hear me? Sorry, we're having a little bit. Of there we go. It's it uh, the uh, <laughs> the treacheries of doing things live, really. But yes, we're we're back. We can hear you, and we're at uh, we're at the correct slide, I believe now. Yeah, yeah. So about uh, you know approaches ten to the five on contact. Mm -hmm. Or can it? I mean, it's a little bit uh, dependent on probe geometry as well. So it's not quite as high as that if you have very large spherical probes, but otherwise it's, you know, it can be pretty high. Got it. Um, and I think we'll take what I think will be the, the final question here um, from Sankara, who uh, who asks, poor adhesion, a reflection of the integrity of the base coat or the top layer? Well, in the example I showed right at the end, that that what I said about poor adhesion, that's just a, 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 a it's a multi I think it's a multi-layer optical coating system, but essentially it's it's um, the adhe the poor adhesion in that case was co uh, uh, caused by uh, um, an ineffective plasma treat treatment uh, if, uh, a plasma cleaning step wasn't wasn't working quite as as normal. And, and so then when the coating was deposited, it, it didn't, uh, wasn't deposited with the same level of adhesion, essentially. So this, this uh, company they work with are very good at that normally, and they, and they knew they had a problem. And it was just, they were just an interesting sample to um, look at sensitivity for, essentially. Okay. Great. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for answering all those questions. So I think with it now being 
uh well 4 p.m uk time i think it's now a uh, a good point for us to draw the webinar to a close so just move on to our our final slide so uh thank you very much everyone in the audience for all of your uh, all of your great questions great discussion uh there um just uh before i begin my intro speech my outro speech excuse me um to question there about accessing the webinars on youtube from the website so if you uh if you uh go on to the surface ventures website surfaceventures.org and scroll down you will see all of our recordings you can also search surface ventures on youtube and all of the coding the coatings sorry recordings are there getting mixed up with uh <laughs> uh things i've been saying in the questions so uh sorry about that everyone and from Micromaterials, so it's a good point for me to share that. So there's a link now present for the Micromaterials LinkedIn page. And of course, you can also visit the uh, Micromaterials website, but the LinkedIn page is great for uh, technical articles, um, links to other webinars, and um, basically a lot of technical material. So please do click on that. Uh, Thank you very much, Ben, for your uh, for your fantastic and engaging talk and for answering all those questions. Thanks to Micromaterials for the support uh, for running this workshop um, as well for other links to share. Please do register for our final uh, keynote talk of the year, Surface Ventures. You can also find the link to this on our website. Uh, this is this will be on the 14th of December um as well on our website so stay tuned to our emails uh check out the surface ventures linkedin page for um updates uh we also have our fortnightly newsletter modern surface the final issue of the year releasing this friday will then be beginning again in january 2024 uh, by signing up to our mailing list you will receive this and finally i'd just like to say um Thanks, everyone. But please do take the time to advertise this to your contacts if you think this will be useful to them. It's great to continue to grow our audience and make more people aware of the work we're doing here. Uh, so see you next time. Uh, but for now, thanks, everyone, for joining today and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks so much. I'd like to echo and say thanks very much to Sam for hosting as usual. And, and thanks, everybody, for the questions. And I hope everybody found it useful. OK, thanks. Bye bye. Fantastic. Thanks, Ben. And goodbye, everyone. <laughs>